it, it's a real privilege uh, for me to introduce uh, this part of uh, uh, the special uh, joint meeting, and that is the uh, presentation of the uh, uh, Russell L. De Souza Award. Um, I have a personal connection to Russ De Souza because he, he and I joined the Unidata Users Committee on the same day, 26 years ago, <laughs> in 1989. And for those of you who don't know Russ De Souza, he was a professor at uh, Millersville University, and. Uh, um, he was a very enthusiastic, active participant in Unidata governance and in the Unidata community. And uh, I don't think I would be sliding anybody else at Millersville when I say this, but Russ D'Souza changed the landscape in terms of Millersville University and its national prominence in the uh, meteorology education world uh, because of the many things he did upon which many others such as uh, Rich Clark and Seppi Elda built on but uh, Russ uh, uh, played an immense role in um, starting many of the things uh, that uh, led to wonderful things uh, uh, for the community as well as at Millersville. Uh, Russ initially served on the users committee and uh, because of his enthusiasm and uh, active engagement, he quickly graduated to the policy committee uh, after a couple, three years, where he again served for uh, uh, you know, roughly three years, and uh, uh, he was uh, struck by melanoma. Um, and after uh, battle for roughly a year and a half or so, he passed away. Um, but during his tenure on the committee, he not only brought so many important matters to the attention of the program center, but also spearheaded one of the first um, community projects uh, in working with the uh, Unity Data Program Center, which was the picking of the floater sector for the day. And uh, Russ and his students picked the location where that sector should look be and what size it should be based on that day's weather or anticipated weather on that particular day. And that program continued for a long period of time because our bandwidth was limited at, back then. Uh, today, we don't worry about the uh, floater sectors because we can send the whole thing you know, via the internet. This predates internet, as you can imagine, the IDD. Uh, this uh, award, Russell L. De Souza Award, honors individuals whose energy expertise and active involvement enable the program center or the unit data program to better serve uh, the geoscience community. Honorees personify unit data's ideal of a community that shares data, software, and ideas through computing, network, and networking technologies and gatherings like this where the community is working, you know, very closely with the staff at the Program Center. Uh, this uh, award was instituted in 2000, um, in 2000, and the first uh, winner came from University of uh, Washington, Harry Edman, that uh, some of you know, and I'm sure Lynn knows him very well because she couldn't do her work without <laughs> Harry. Um, and we also are privileged to have last year's winner in the room here, uh, Rich Signal. Uh, and you all know what Rich uh, has done for uh, the Unidata community over the years. Uh, we have another outstanding awardee, our winner this year, in Scott Jacobs, and I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Tile. Thanks, Mohan. Really gives me a very great pleasure to uh, present the award to Scott. Uh, Scott and I actually go back a quite a long way. Um, when I was looking for grad school back in 1990, I happened to uh, visit the department at University at Albany and walked into the main office and the uh, department secretary at the time uh, just kind of said, Scott, Scott happened to be uh, present and so uh, she, she sick Scott on me and uh, Scott gave me a little bit of a tour and you know at the time I had uh, a lot of schools to consider 
And, you know, after meeting with Scott, I, I got back and thought about it and said, I'm not going to go to UAlbany. So, uh, but a year later, I found the, uh, experienced the errors, I realized the errors of my ways, and I, I did return to Albany and got my master's there from 91 to 95. And uh, of course, one of the first things I did when I joined the department is I started to play around with this, this program called GEMPAC, which uh, I know, as most of us know here, Scott was instrumental in uh, developing. Um, I remember back in the day, it was all a, a menu uh, driven program and you'd actually launch Gempack by just typing Gempack and at the end of your session what it would do is when you exited it would play this little kind of ASCII art animation I mean this was 1991 uh, there was no YouTube back then I think right now since it was October it was aware of what what month it was and when you signed out of Gempack I think it would show the three ships the Nina the Pinta and the Santa Maria and it would say happy Columbus Day um, keep in bugging Scott to get that added back in that was that was just amazing um, you know as, as Mohan said um, relating the story about um, Russell D'Souza um, it is really a, a great pleasure to present this award to Scott because it really has special meaning because Scott actually uh, studied at Millersville and got his bachelor's in 1988 and so he actually uh, had the pleasure of having Russ D'Souza as his advisor. So I think this is probably uh, you know, a watershed moment where now we are starting to see some of the fruits of the labors of someone like Russ and have produced folks like Scott who have done so much to advance the, uh, the, what, what Unidata brings to the community. Uh, and then I also, my, my time with Scott was not done, although he finished his master's where he worked with uh, Bernie Vonnegut, uh, who some of you may know was a pioneer in atmospheric electricity and uh, cloud physics and uh, even rainmaking. I um, worked with Scott from uh, 1995 to 97, my first job, and I would have to say that Scott was quite influential in uh, my career development as that's really where I got my program skills working with uh, GEMPAC and, and AWIP. So again, very great pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to present the award to Scott. So without further ado, almost like a uh, Academy Award moment, but Scott, um, for your dedication, enthusiasm, and ins inspiration that truly reflect the goals and ideals of the Unidata program, um, on behalf of the Users Committee and Unidata, very proud to present you, Scott, with the 2015 Russell L. D'Souza Award. You exemplified these ideals through your long-standing support and development of GEMPAC and its associated NAWIP software. More recently, your involvement with the ABIPS 2 system, as we heard just earlier today, has played a crucial role in coordinating Unidata's distribution of this keenly awaited package to the university community. So we offer this award in recognition and appreciation of your many years of outstanding service to the Unidata community. Scott, congratulations. present Scott who will deliver I'm sure a very entertaining talk I hope so as soon as I see computer screen saved on me all right so um, part of this I hate having to be right at the microphone but we'll deal with that um, so the previous presentation was kind of serious, but if anyone knows me, I hate being serious all the time. So if you feel like laughing or even groaning because of something I say, please do so. Um, I tried to make this a little more lighthearted than very serious. So just bear with me if you don't like humor. <laughs> bear with me if you like humor and you don't find this funny. <laughs> All right. 
So uh, Gempack is probably the biggest reason I'm here. Spent 20 years, more than 20 years, supporting Gempack for NSEP, for Unidata. But before we get to Gempack, I do want to <clears throat> talk about the history of Gempack, my involvement, but let's take a slight detour. Okay. So in the beginning, I was born a small child in Florida at Homestead Air Force Base in 1966. So quick, do the math. Um, but Homestead was destroyed by Hurricane Andrew in 1992. That was a little devastating. Before that, though, my parents told me that they rode through Hurricane Betsy in 1965. Betsy hit Key Largo as a Category 3 hurricane. And there was a lot of flooding. And in the aftermath, my mom says there were crabs ankle deep in all the streets. They all just got, and that's, I guess, where Joe's Crab Shack started. I don't, I don't know. Um, so, but uh, after that, so my dad was in at Homestead because he was getting ready to go to Vietnam. He went to Vietnam and my mom and I moved back to Pennsylvania. So th it's not my whole history, but we're getting there. So as I grew up, I fell in with a bad crowd, as, as one does. I was the leader of the gang, if you're trying to find me there. Um, we did terrible things. We rode our bikes around the neighborhood. We played in the steel mill slag dump just because this was the time before video games. So what did we do? We played outside. And we spent a lot of time outside. And the thing is, and I always have some weather data here. The thing is, I don't remember having a bad day that summer in 76. It was really nice. It was always nice. And I think this is probably the first time I started thinking about a career in meteorology. Well, you see the guys on weather on the TV. So it's like, I want to be the guy on, on Channel 2 News. And, you know, but it's about the first time I thought about this. Shortly after that, I kind of took up the game of golf. Well, I learned about the frustration of playing golf. You know, hitting a ball, chasing after it. You know, it, this is attributed to uh, Mark Twain, but it wasn't him. Somebody said, a, go a golf is a good walk spoiled. And some days I believe that. But a few years later, I started working at our lo local golf course, our country club. It allowed me to spend a lot of time outside for four summers. Outdoor maintenance engineer, I was a groundskeeper. <laughs> you know. um, so paid a, paid a lot of attention to the weather because you know, we're always outside, we're cutting the grass, we're watering, we're spraying for bugs, spraying for disease. We need to know when the weather's gonna help us or hurt us. So this really started to play into what I was thinking about during those high school years about getting into the field. So, so eventually made it to Millersville and Russ, as, as uh, was noted, was, was my advisor, and that does make this a little extra special. Um, yeah, everyone looks a little young in this photo. Uh, Russ was, he was a great advisor. He was really, really easy to talk to about everything, not just schoolwork. So, you know, losing Russ was a big, big blow to Millersville, but he was quickly replaced, well, not replaced, but augmented by, by Rich and Rich Clark and Bob Ross. Um, you know, Russ got into helping everybody with, with their experiments, with doing classwork. Um, a lot of those four years are a blur, not because of anything that I did, but uh, just it went really fast. I do remember, though, a big snowstorm that hit because we actually closed school for like the first time in forever. And we got 13 inches of snow. And, you know, it, it was a big deal. And I had, 
I was working on the school newspaper as the as the uh, sports editor for a couple years, and at, right after this big snowstorm, uh, they decided the, the rest of the staff decided to interview Russ about the student weather center and about the forecast for this for that snowfall. So that's just a clip from the newspaper. So then, as Kevin mentioned, I made it to Albany and worked with Dr. Vonnegut. Um, when I met Bernie, it was an interesting uh, experience. He lit a piece of paper, breathed in the smoke, and blew it into an ice chest and made a cloud. I'm like, what are you, what are you doing breathing that in? <laughs> but the, the paper was laced with silver iodide. And that's what Bernie was known for, really, was coming up with a way of seeding clouds using silver iodide. And it actually made it into a Jeopardy question that I saw. So uh, I think that's kind of the pinnacle, if you can make it into a Jeopardy question. So, um, but Bernie was also interested in cloud electrification. Now, personally, I didn't work on this, but he was very interested in lightning around volcanoes. So he made a lot of trips to Iceland and um, spent a lot of time on the cloud electrification because it's not a typical cloud where you have ice and, you know, it's more static electricity driven. So. Um, so from, for the weather part of this, you know, I remember there were two Februarys that were kind of weird. One was in 1989, shortly after I arrived. And it was the first week of February, and we were walking around in shorts. And then a year later, everything was covered by ice and snow. We had three quarters of an inch of ice that you basically needed a hammer and chisel to get off the windshield. <clears throat> So, getting to Gempack. So we're finally here. While at Albany, I looked around at my friends and classmates, and they're all using NCAR graphics for all of their displays and doing their calculations. And, and they have to do everything for themselves by hand. And there's not a lot of co-chairing going on because it's kind of like, no, this is mine, go away, kind of stuff. And I looked at it, I'm like, well, wait, we got this gem pack thing, and we had just gotten version four, I think it was at the time, which was released from NASA and Unidata. It was on the VAX. And I looked at it, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. You mean all the programs are written already, and all I got to do is put my data in it? And there's a whole bunch of programs that I can use that already exist? Yeah, I think I'm going to use that instead. <sighs> so there were two, in particular, two doctoral students who were using GEMPAC to do all of their work. I started talking to them about surface data, plotting it observa as observations, gridding it up. So I learned everything I could about the Barnes analysis that we have in the code. Um, I started using it to, to take, those are a few pictures from my thesis, um, take all the data that I had as observations, grid it up, and I played a lot with the Barnes analysis to get it just right. Um, and, and I started looking at the data not just as well, at the time they were essays. METAR didn't even exist yet. Um, but they only came out once an hour. But we had some more frequent data, so I modified, I started getting into the code at this point. Got into the code, modified the data storage and the Mediogram program to do more frequent data steps than hourly. And that's when I started looking at the code and thinking, you know, this is pretty well put together. This is 
pretty interesting code. I wonder what I can do with this. <laughs> but in the meantime, I started teaching also. And you know, you start teaching, you're doing labs for the, for the intro class. I also did two summers as teaching the entire intro class myself. And through that time period, this is the, this is the way you did overlays, right? You had acetates on an overhead projector. So I plotted up a couple things and then would take one off and put the other on the base map and show that to the class. And so very straightforward way, right? <laughs> so getting ready to leave Albany, I'm fine. Well, I didn't get my thesis done. But I'm getting ready to leave Albany. <laughs> I finally did get it done. But, uh, and I started talking to Dan Kaiser at Albany, who had worked at NASA. Because like I said, Jump Pack looks like an interesting program. I'll, I wonder if there's any jobs there. So knew that it was developed at NASA, talked to Dan. And he said, you know, you should probably call this guy, call Louie. I'm like, Who's Louie? What are you talking about? So I called Dr. Uccellini, who had just moved to NMC, now NSEP. And he says, yeah, we don't have any jobs here, but a lot of us, Louie, Mary Desjardins, Keith Brill, a whole host of people, have just left NASA, so they probably have some jobs. Like, thanks a lot. So, and this is where I, I had a really great image that somebody had drawn that was a bunch of rats jumping off the NASA ship, and each one had its own name on it, and they were jumping into the NMC life draft. And I can't find it, and it really upsets me that I can't find it. But that's, I wanted to show that, so that, picture that picture up there. <laughs> So, ended up going to NASA to Goddard's, Goddard uh, Space Flight Center to work on JumpPack. And like I said, JumpPack started on the VAX. We didn't have these when I, well, we had the MicroVAX when I got there, but not the PDP-11. Um, and that was version four. And then just before leaving NASA, Mary put together version five, which the big thing there was it moved to Unix and it had X Windows display. Yeah, that's a big deal. So those are the old manuals and a new manual from NSEP. But, so version five is where we're at and we now go to operations. So this is more of the, the gem pack history part. So, I worked at NASA for eight months, finished my thesis, sent it in, got my degree. Don't, no worries there. But I worked there for eight months, and Mary said, you know what? You got any, uh, you know anybody back at Albany that uh, might want a job that they're just coming out of school? And I'm like, well, wait a minute, what about me? <laughs> Why give this to somebody else? So she said, okay, come on down. So, so I, came, I went down to NMC. And <clears throat> this is at about the time, this is like early 90s, so we're getting ready to move to AWIPS 1, right? Or at least start the planning for AWIPS 1. Well, AWIPS 90, which didn't come out until 96. Um, so this is the whole modernization for the weather service. And at the time, you know, NMC is turning into NSEP, we're moving to, or we're planning out AWIPS-1, and the program said, you know what, there's too much going on with just the WFOs, you NSEP centers are on your own. So we looked at it and we're like, okay, what are we gonna do? Well, we have Mary there, we have a few other people who had worked on GEMPAC, let's use that as our core to build an AWIPS. And it's not, it doesn't stand for not AWIPS, okay? That's, 
but we decided to go that route and build something for all the centers that could be used for NCEP to to basically get off of we had we had at least five different systems that were being used so this consolidated everything onto one platform display uh, drawing and and everything that we needed to do so here's I have some pictures here we have all of the national centers started using and AWIPS eventually. The first was the a Aviation Weather Center because they were being created in Kansas City. They weren't allowed to take any other equipment. So we took and we started with them, but we, we did the software in such a way that we could pull out the common aspects that everybody needed. So everybody needed to display a map, everybody needed drawing tools, and we we moved down that road and um, yeah so it was it was really the the drawing tools the product generation that was the key to everything that tied all of the centers together and if we could display global data or images or anything else underneath that was great but everybody had to draw something so and Forgive me for this one. I'm going to read these because I'll forget. So the CPC, for instance, they have their above, near, and below normal forecasts for week two. So that's, that's something they draw in NMAP right now. The high-level charts from the AWC, all of the features are drawn using NMAP. The OPC, their wave heights and directions. The Hurricane Center tracks the, mostly here it's the, the watches and warnings are what we draw. The uh, tornado box, the tornado watch box from the SPC. The now WPC, the Weather Prediction Center, has fronts and weather that they, and sensible weather elements that they put on a map. Now, I also have the Swipsy picture. That's not generally gem pack, but we used a lot of the techniques that we have for imagery display when we got to the Swipsy work. So a lot of the, the legacy of, of all of that display moved on to, to the AWIPS 2, which is where we're at. So. When we, when we began work on AWIPS 2 from the NCEP point of view, they finally included us in, in the program. They said, okay, AWIPS 1 was, you know, we know what we're doing there, so when we transition to WFOs, that should be pretty straightforward. So we'll include the national centers now too. So they, they took all our requirements, and but realized that they couldn't meet all of the requirements through the contractor so the team at NCEP still did a lot of the work so the the WFOs were being converted as a quote black box meaning that the, the interface was the same or supposed to be the same and even though they changed out the engine under the hood so now we have basically a Ferrari and a Volkswagen body. So, um, but the NCEP group didn't have that stipulation because we couldn't use, the, or we couldn't exactly replicate the user interface because we didn't have control over the core code. So we had to adapt and we made, up, we made adjustments and that's why the NCP doesn't look exactly like NMAP. It's pretty close, but it's, it's just off. But we added in some functionality that we didn't put into NMAP, like um, the, the multi-panel from Entrans, or we incorporated NSharp directly into the code so you could interact with soundings. And in fact, NSharp is now available from D2D as well. So, so Here's some, I got some displays of some of the things that we did 
with the NCP to make it to uh, to bring out the uh, the similar displays and functionality that we had in Nmap. So the big thing again here was product generation, and that's the last picture that came up there. The in Nmap the VG format was something that we made up. I mean it didn't exist anywhere else before we just made it up but here we've now gone to more of a standard you know XML base that's more that's based on the uh, geographical markup language makes it a little easier for uh, for development for using packages that already exist um, that was one of the things with Gempack was everything was most everything was done in the code, right? So when we needed to display to a PostScript file, I learned PostScript language and wrote the code that created a PostScript file. Don't have to do that anymore because somebody has done that and we should be able to leverage it. You know, um, the Gempack file format is unique to Gempack. AWIPS2 uses HDF5, NetCDF, you know, everything that is our standards in the field. So we're, we're moving that way. And now, eight years later, eight, roughly eight years later, we're almost to the point of transitioning the first center. And as I pointed out earlier today, most of the centers will be right behind that within a couple years from that point. Um, and then, as we've heard, Michael here at Unidata has, has been working very hard on getting everything working with AWIPS2 so that the, the universities can use it. And, and that's like the best thing that could have happened. He's very diligent in doing his work. So. So, AWIPS and beyond, where are we headed? I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. Um, the concepts, the functionality from Gempack, and in some cases the actual code, are in AWIPS. There are places where we had to write, wrap the Fortran and C code because we couldn't rewrite it quickly enough. Eventually, the weather service is going to be all AWIPS all the time, and I don't know what that means for Gempack support. Um, won't be needed by the forecasters once the center, the national centers, are all on AWIPS. And I'm also a little concerned about the next generation of support. Who knows Fortran and C? anymore. It's all Java and Python, right? Um, so Gempack, somebody said yesterday that Gempack was dated. Well, I think it was dated in 2005 and it needs, it needs an overhaul. If we had not been converting to AWIPS, we had a plan to overhaul the entire system and make it actually what turns out to be more like the way AWIPS was, even though none of us knew that. <laughs> um, so I'm a little concerned, but as, far, as long as I have a computer, I'll help out. <laughs> so, and just for Kevin, here's my last slide. <laughs> Nice talk, very nice trajectory in your career as well. <laughs> Thank you. Kevin? Has there ever been any, uh, well, when you had the plan in 2005, was there ever any kind of thought in making Jetpack code uh, open to have the best of the app, by the way? Because whenever I'm <coughs> explaining to Jetpack, Yeah. 
Yes, in fact, um, it was <clears throat> it was early two thousands. One of the developers on his own just went and made modifications to the DM library to access OpenDAP or to access some sort of web. I'm not sure OpenDAP was the standard at that time, but it he he accessed some sort of web environment to read data directly from a remote system. So yes, that was part of the plans of our big project that never came out. Any other questions? So I don't know very much about your net. I don't ever remember your net. I do remember though that when I was on the GLOW program, uh, when it was at the GLOW, I did some visualization. Uh, we had done some visualization. But I think you just had That's, that's another area that I've thought about because right now, as, as modular as Gempack is, it is very tied to its own data format. And a lot of the information that's required to initiate and run these algorithms are found in the files. And if you would want to make a library of functions that would allow you to do just the Barnes analysis, for example, you would need to set up something to have a lot of user input that you find in currently in the data files. So it's not impossible, but it's that step of things that would need to have to need to happen. And but I have thought about that. Jeff, I, I'll add to what you said because this reminded me of something and Mike was involved in this a few years ago. I had a student submitted a, a manuscript and it came back and we were told we needed to do a Gaussian, apply a Gaussian filter to get rid of these small scale waves because we were trying to compare um, a model that ran on a four kilometer grid with a coarser uh, ruck, I think, analysis. And I think Mike may have been the one to suggest that you know, the Gaussian filter in GEMPAC it would be an excellent one that could do what we needed to because we knew we needed to filter out waves of say seven delta x or something or something like that. We had looked all oh, I asked so many people, I looked everywhere, I thought, well there must just be some Gaussian filter sitting around, it'd be really easy to find. Could never find it and in the in the nightmare in a way yeah. was taking our work output, turning it into GEMPAC output right. so that we could use the Gaussian, but after months and, and luckily an extension on the deadline for the revisions that's what we had to turn to, and, it, and it, it's an awesome tool, and I was just shocked that I couldn't seem to find answers outside of that within GenPack. Right. Um, Mohan, did you, were you gonna? I forgot what I was okay. gonna ask. I thought I saw a hand over here. I did have a hand, but uh, um, it'll come to me, <laughs> hopefully so. Well, we're, we're pretty close to the schedule, actually five minutes early. Um, I think we'll break, take our break for lunch, and since we already took care of the photo, which would have been the first 15 minutes after lunch, we'll, we'll have a nice expanded lunch, so we'll be back here at 1.30, uh, when we're really making Scott work for his money today, because I see he <laughs> is the next speaker as well. On, on. So see everybody back here at 1.30.